when did you first fall in love with movies? Um, I guess I was pretty young. Um, I don't know, probably around 14, 15, something like that. Um, mm. we, we were kind of lucky in France because there was um, two shows, uh, one on Friday night and one on, on Sunday night on the French television. You know, we had less channels than you have in the U.S. And so those were kind of a cine club. So they were broadcasting, uh, you know, old old movie, you know, whatever kind of movie. It could have, it could have been silent movie or, or modern movie or, you see, so any kind of movie. So so I, I basically was watching, uh, you know, every Friday night and every Sunday night I was watching this, this show and um, that's when I discover uh, movies, really. But when did you when did you realize that there was a uh, that there was a cinematographer behind the camera and that he was capturing images? And, and who were the early cinematographers that meant a lot to you? When I was watching movie on, on TV and going to the cinema, I mean, again, we we're, we're lucky in Paris uh, because. When I was a kid, you know, there was 400 movies here in Paris, so you could see you know, whatever movie you wanted. So, so I was I, um, I was not really aware of uh, of the cinematography. Uh, in fact, I wanted to be a director, and um, hmm. and uh, when I was 20 or 19 years old, I, I got a grant from the government to to direct a short film, and uh, my cinematographer was um, Henri Alcan. He was a, you know, a French master of black and white. He shot The Beauty and the Beast near the Jean Cocteau movie. Mm. And, um, and that's when I realized that I, I was a poor director, but I, I was really interested in cinematography. Uh, I mean, they were, watching him working was just like a dream. You know, it, was, uh, it was fascinating. And I was, I was more fascinated with what he was doing than uh, directing the actors and talking to them, so so suddenly it it, it I think it um, it was something that I I I really discover on set, really, mm -hmm. and then I watch back all the movie I saw before, you know, and uh, I said, okay, so there is a guy behind all those images, and it's the cinematographer. Oh. Working with the director, obviously, the cinematographer is not alone. And he cannot do anything uh, without um, the director's approval. So, well, get into your your resume. When when Amelie came your way, um, yeah. it, did it, did it feel like a a special project from the from the beginning? I mean, did it feel like this could be a a breakthrough for you? No, I mean, you you. Uh, first of all, you never think this way. You know, you you have a good script or you have a bad script. You know, so, um, so I thought it was a good script. But I, you know, Jeanne is is my best friend. You know, we started together. So, um, when I worked on the short film, I wrote short film with him. So, and we have a company together. So it's just like um, he asked me to do Amini because Doris he turned it down. So, so when the project com came to me, you know, I said, "Oh, that's a pretty good script, uh, Jean Pierre." You know, and but I, 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 we had a big argument when I read it. Uh, after I read it, he asked me what I thought. I said, "Oh, it's a very light movie," and he went berserk. He went mad. He said, "Yeah, it's always us with you. You know, you, you like Makowski, Antonioni, all those kind of guy, and blah blah blah. Everything I do." It's just too light for you, and I said, no, no, that's what I mean. It's not what I mean. It's a, it's a very light um, and and very beautiful romantic comedy. You yeah, know, I, I want to do it. So he said, okay, okay, fair enough. But um, <laughs> but you know, the success of this movie was a surprise for all of us. All of us. It was just like a incredible. I mean, nobody ever think it would be a success like that. You know? Even, even Jean-Pierre, you know, he, he really said, oh, okay, it's going to be a small movie. And it was a, it was a cheap movie, and a low-budget movie. And he said, we, we're going to try to have fun, and that's it. And uh, 
So it's only when the movie was released that uh, you know we we didn't understand what happened really. Uh, how come it was such a big success? Uh, we don't know. We still don't know. I mean, it's it's unpredictable. You, you, you mm-hmm. never can predict the success anyway. Um, but it was a good script. That, that's it. You know, so and uh, and and there was probably some things that, that people uh, liked about it. You know. <laughs> Uh, well, and and you know, in terms of your work on it, uh, the American Cinematographer ranked it as the the best of the of the previous decade uh, in terms of the photography yeah. of it. Oh my gosh, that, what a what a wonderful compliment that must have been. Um, it, but, no, it, it is, but you know, I, I was really honored that uh, you know, it's um, <laughs> I, sorry, sorry, oh. I don't know. How can you say that? I mean, it, it, it's uh, first of all, it, 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 I don't know. It's uh, you no. Know, I'm really proud of it. Let, let's put it this way. I'm, I'm really proud of it. I was really happy when I when the American cinematographer called me and said, "Oh, you won," and blah blah. I said, "Wow, God, yes, you know, that's really something." On the other hand, you know, that's uh, those kind of competitions are, are, are kind of uh, strange. Um, you would have asked Doris Conji just to shoot uh, Annelie. It would have been a different movie, you see. And uh, mm-hmm. so, would it, would it have been better? I don't know. It would have been different. And uh, when you see the, the, the 50 uh, cinematographers, uh, you know, in this poll from the AC, uh, they are they are among the best DPs in the world, you see. And uh, how can I be better than Roger Deakins and, and uh, you know, and Chivo or Bob Richardson or Harry Savidas? You know, those guys were are, are legend. You know, so um, I, I don't think I can compete with them. You see, you see what I mean? It's just like, uh, yeah, Children of Men was uh, was stunning. You know, and uh, and what was uh, in this decade? I don't remember, but there was an unbelievable movie, No Country for All Men. Out. How can people say that family was better than No Country for All Men? Nobody can say such a thing. You know, I, a, I understand. No yeah, you, you, know, you it, see what I mean. So, I, so I'm, I'm I'm really proud of it. But uh, but it's um, and I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy. I won. But it's uh, it's uh, it's what it is. I mean, it's. Uh, I think I think that people love to make it. Uh, competitive in some way with the awards and such but but really each project has its own unique challenges has its own exactly. demands i mean completely different projects you know yeah exactly it's uh, that's exactly what happened you know and yeah i'm, I'm just expecting now since i, I did inside Louis davis with the current brothers yeah you know, uh, it, it's going to be about uh, Roger Deakins sooner or later. You know, even at Cannes Film Festival, you know, the first question at the press conference was, uh, was how was it to work with Bruno uh, after you you've done twelve or fourteen movies with Roger Deakins? You know, that's the first question they had at the press conference, and they, you, you know, and they didn't ask it to me. They asked it to the Cannes brothers. So. But it's um, it's um. Uh, yeah, I mean, Roger, yeah, it, Roger uh, would have shot inside Lewin Davis. It would be a different movie, and that's it. Period. Yeah, and and Roger is a fantastic cinematographer, and I I was scared when I started this movie uh, because because uh, you know he he's I have to fit big shoes, you know, so <laughs> just uh, to fill big big shoes. And uh, is um, I felt uncomfortable at the very beginning, and then I forgot about it. I said, you know, I'm I'm just doing what I think is right for this movie. That's his period, and um, and it kind of worked. You know, uh, Joel and Ethan were really happy with what I've done. So that's yeah. that's the best compliment for me. Well, I I haven't been able to see the film yet, Inside Lou and Davis, but I've definitely seen all the all the f- footage and trailers that have been released, and it, it, it looks absolutely stunning. And I want to get a sense from you of of how you go about planning the, the the visual look of a film, of the world that you're creating. So let's let's take Inside Lou and Davis. When you receive that script. What what do you hold on to? What do you find in the script that lets you know? Okay, this is the direction I need to take with the look of the film. Um, 
I think for, for me, Inside Louis Davis was, was a folk song. And, uh, you know, when I read the script, I said, well, oh, it's a strange, very strange, dark comedy. And, uh, I didn't know really where to go. And then I, I, you know, and I listened to folk music. You know, I'm not a specialist of folk music. It's not my culture, really. But I, you know, I, I kind of worship uh, Bob Dylan. And, but I, I asked uh, John and Ethan what kind of music they were they were using on this movie and, and they just sent me a couple of you know, um, songs and uh, they said you should listen to this and that and uh, you know just like Pete Seeger or whoever you know, or even Devon Ronk since the movie is kind of loosely based on his biography so um, and I listened to those and I, I, I tried to understand where this music come from you know and and uh, Obviously, I'm, I'm a Parisian, so he doesn't talk to me the same way that he does to uh, somebody from Nashville or, or from, uh, you know, who, who grew up with this kind of music in America. But, um, but there was something, all the songs they wanted to use in this movie were kind of sad, and there is something about a uh, dark mood somehow. And, and so that's probably the way to go, because this movie, the script is a folk song. I said, okay, so what is a folk song to me? And uh, I tried to, after I listened to all those songs, I said, okay, that's, there's something about sadness, but uh, with uh, beautiful melodies usually. And uh, I said, okay, so let's, let's, um, how can I translate this in, in, in light and, uh, and mood? And so I, I, I basically, it was a starting point, you know, I said, okay, well, well what would be a sad mood? You know, what, uh, how can I use light this way? So, and, and therefore, you know, and you know, from from there, I I, I said, okay, so I, I am going to use a strong light. It's going to be a very soft light, very you know, with with the light fading, you know, falling off in the set. You know, so, and I, it's going to be kind of front lit, but then mm-hmm. then the background is always dark, and so it's. It was this kind of uh, of thing, you know, so really no no beam of light whatsoever. There is probably one beam of light, two beams of light that at the end of the movie and you know, one at night. But other than that it's very, very soft and very very dark, you know. So so I thought, I thought it was a starting point. But uh, but it's a, uh, you know um I start to work this way since uh, since Harry Potter. Uh, you know, Harry Potter is a variation on grey. You know, just like a, a, a like the a, uh, a Goldo variation. You see, just okay. So we have a <clears throat> we have a we have kind of a six notes, and we're going to play variation on those six notes. And so for me, you know, Potter was based on this. It was a variation of on grey. So it's. It's a uh, red gray, blue gray, green gray, and uh, it's it's a variation of this with color at certain points, we really, really bright colors. So I thought it was an interesting way of seeing this movie. But yeah. I, uh, yeah, I use those kind of um, analogy, if I may say so, uh, just to to create a mood. Um, Here's another thing that interests me because you've done several um, period pieces. Uh, Inside Lewin Davis is one. I mean, this this film takes place in the early 60s, I believe. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at the period details like costuming and set design and that sort of stuff, that, that dictates its own direction. But if you also look at the films that were made in the 60s, they have a very... Uh, distinctive look. D- did you try to at all replicate the, the look of cinema from that period? No, no. I, I, but I, and I think it's a big mistake. It mm-hmm. would be a big mistake. You know, when I did Across the Universe, which was uh, around uh, the, around the sixties as well. You know, with Vietnam War and things, things, things like that. You know, I uh, the mood was much more colorful than Inside Louis Nevis. And it's it's kind of the same period, and uh, but I, I you know I think it's a big mistake just try to copy. I mean, uh, uh, just like even even using Kodachrome or, or whatever Chrome, you see, it's uh, I think it's wrong yeah, because mm-hmm. uh, 
because in fact, you know, the color never really changed from the Middle Ages. <laughs> it's a, the color, the light is still the same. It's just the techniques change, you know. So, um, you know, before they discovered color photography, it was black and white so they, because they couldn't do color because they didn't discover how to do it. So, but it doesn't mean that the color wasn't there. They were. You know, the word is in color, it's not in black and white. So, so I think, uh, you know, when you try to copy, uh, what was the 60s or the 50s or whatever period? It's um, it's I think it's a kind of mistake just trying to copy, and uh, because they didn't have the technology we have now, and uh, and maybe in 20 years from now it's going to be different as well. So you know, people trying to copy, you know, year 2013, it's going to be different. Yeah, you know, and. and uh, but that's an interesting question because that's what's going to happen with the digital world as well. You know, it's uh, it's going to be we, the the way we see images and the way we receive receive images going to change a lot. You know, so mm. yeah, yeah, I, I have a fantastic book about Chrome at home, and uh, and I oh, I'm always fascinated by those colors, but they are not real. They are not real. You know, so the only thing which is real is. Uh, Pastelli color of the American cars, you know, and all the furniture, all the, which is really typical from the 50s and 60s in America. They were really different in Europe. So, again, yeah, that was that was one of the arguments, uh, not the argument, but one thing I, I, I told to Joanna Neeson is, I'm a Parisian, you know, the 60s in Paris were totally different than the 60s in New York. So it would be a mistake for me just try to to learn what it was you know, because I, I it's not my word. So what is my word is storytelling with light. This I I kind of know how to do it. So I'm gonna start with the with the script and we're gonna discuss what it could be in terms of mood. And the mood is more interesting than duplicated the certain period. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I understand completely what you're saying um, because a lot of the interviews that I've been doing with cinematographers recently, uh, we've talked about uh, about them referencing other films because you can't help but have those references in your mind. But of, of, yeah. of the challenge of making them your own, of not being a slave to those references, um, yeah. so. So that has come up quite a bit, and and also with with something like like inside Lewin Davis, you mentioned color, um, and and from what I've seen, it seems to have a very muted, soft, as you said, color palette. So when you when you bring in any elements of of color in a film, uh, it really has to speak to the theme of the film or of a particular scene, I would think. You have to use it very sparingly to say something with it. Yeah, I think I yeah. think so. But, they, uh, you know, uh, I think the real heart of cinematography is uh, is uh, what Greg Toland did on Citizen Kane or Greg yeah. O'Farr, you see. That's the real heart of cinematography. And it has nothing to do with color, black and white, or whatever. He has to deal with... Uh, is it interesting in that specific scene just to be silhouette, for example? That's that's a good question, and that's uh, you know I I, I talk to students sometimes. I said, look, there is one scene in Citizen Kane which is fascinating. It's when uh, um, Kane when he he, he writes his bill of uh, how do you how do you say? It? I'm sorry, my English is poor. Um, he, he writes this bill of um, it's the kind of rule he's going to set for the newspaper, and uh, so he's writing this uh, bill uh, in on a wall like that, and uh, he's lit, and uh, there is uh, there is a gas light on the wall, and he's lit on on the right hand side, I think, and then he's finished with writing that, and he goes to the desk, he turn he, he turn around, go to the desk where. Um, you know, um, Joseph Cotton and the other actor are there, you know, waiting for him to 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 read it. And uh, he goes there, and he's totally silhouette when the two of them are lit. 
and he, he, he read this bill of rights or whatever you call it, mm-hmm. and he, he stole his silhouette. And he said, okay, this guy going to lose. You know, he's, uh, he's totally black, you know, and he's, he's saying things that he will never do. It's, a, it's, a, it's that's for me, it's pure uh, cinematography, uh, and, and it's, it's pure storytelling with light. And uh, mm-hmm. that's what I try to do. You know, it's, uh, lighting is easy. You know, everybody can light a scene, but, um, but to make it interesting and to make it, to, to use light as a story point is very hard. And uh, that's what I, I, I'm, I'm looking for. You know? So how can I make it? How can I, how can I use light and framing just to convey uh, an emotion or something? That's the most interesting thing. Otherwise, you know, uh, it's only a look. And a look is boring. A you know, look going to fade. It's just like commercial, you know. If you set a look, you know, it's going to age. You know, ten years later, this look going to sustain. You see, it's going to vanish. But uh, because it's only a look, it's just a fashion. But um, if you succeed in, in like uh, Greg Tolan succeeded, you know, it, it will last forever. You know, uh, yesterday I was talking to uh, uh, Darius uh, Walski, um, mm-hmm. and and we were talking about. Um, there, there are different approaches to cinematography. There, there are some uh, ph- photographers and directors that, that, that like the camera to just be an observer uh, mm-hmm. in a scene, and there are others that like it to be an active participant, like another performer in the scene. Uh, do you yeah. have a preference? No, because I, uh, you know, um, Jeanne has a very proactive camera. You know, he moves his camera a lot, and... Uh, and the Coen's brothers don't move it at all. It's just so, uh, I like them both. You, I mean, I, uh, that's, uh, that's their style, you know, and I'm, 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 again, part of my job is trying to understand what their style is and, and, uh, and to follow this style, you know. I'm talking about top directors, you <laughs> see, the directors mm-hmm. who have, who have a style. There's so many who don't, so it's, uh, and they don't even know what they're doing, but uh, those know exactly what they're doing, and they have their own style. And uh, what is interesting is uh, how, uh, is to answer the question: What can I uh, give them, uh, which is me? You see, I mean, uh, as Bruno Delbonel, so I'm a cinematographer. I have my own background. There is thing I like to do. There is thing I don't like to do. There is, uh, you know, as I told you before, before we. we the telephone died. Um, I, say, I, I like contemporary art. You see, so that's my background, really, and that's what I like. And I, I, I think cinematography should be a, a real art form. So, as an art form, can I can I give something to the director and not changing their style? You see, it's uh, you know when uh, Tim Burton, for example, and uh, we are sh- we are shooting now, uh, uh, Big Eyes, and um, and Tim doesn't want to answer any question. Uh, he just waits for the, for the first blocking with the actor first thing in the morning. And that's what we do. So I don't know what he want to do uh, when I come on set. You know, so I have to be totally open to, to what the actors want to do. And, and uh, it's kind of a challenge because I, after, after the blocking, I have half an hour just to write something and to find an idea, but um, but he's he's uh, Tim, and it was the same on Dark Shadows. He didn't want to rehearse before or before Johnny Depp was on set. It was just like mm-hmm. no, no, I I I don't know. We have to wait for Johnny, and uh, it was great. It's a great experience, but uh, so it, it's his way. As opposed to the Kant Brothers way, which is totally storyboarded. So I know exactly how many servers I'm going to do and uh, uh, almost what lens I'm going to be using. So it's, uh, it's less organic, but it's, uh, it's absolutely brilliant as well. And so well, yeah, and it sounds, I mean, Dark Shadows for me last year, Dark Shadows was a, was one of the very few movies that I felt like, 
I was living inside of that world. Like I, I was totally lost in that world and that environment you created. It's such an incredible mm-hmm. accomplishment, I thought that was. But uh, it, but it surprises me the way you're saying that Tim Burton has been working in these last two projects with you because it sounds almost as if something that you'd find in documentaries, that, it, it, that the work evolves on the day. I mean, it's constantly evolving. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that's, that's what the movie is about. I, yeah, I, I think yeah. it, uh, um, you know, there is, there is those big discussion about storyboarding, not storyboarding, or whatever thing. You see, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a boring discussion because uh, it's as if, you know, people said, oh, if I storyboard, the project won't evolve, and it's just like the Bible, and, uh, and so there is no freedom for the actor, there is no freedom of anything, uh, which is, Stupid because uh, he, you know inside the storyboard the Grant's brother were 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 uh, looking at their actors they were talking to them and they were they were uh, the project evolved you know even if it was uh, they changed a couple of shots but uh, it was kind of the same but uh, but the the whole the whole movie evolved from uh, and we you, you can see it when you when you see it and it, it's just. Uh, uh, it just fade a little bit, and and some something which were very little thing becomes big, became big, and uh, and much more emotional than they they plan it to be, and uh, and and the same with Tim Burton, he, he, the project is uh, kept evolving every day. It's a different thing, and that's that's what is fantastic. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean it's uh, it's what you, you that's what every painter. I said about their work, you know, just like uh, I don't know, Winnie the Kooning or, or, or Jackson Pollock, and when they started painting, they didn't know what they were doing. You know, they they had an idea and they were open to to the canvas to talk to them. You see, and uh, and the canvas talked to you, and uh, I, I think the camera talked to you. You know, there is a moment where the the movie, what you, the dailies. Uh, when you watch them, they are talking to you, and, the, yeah. and the, the, the movie itself is talking to you. And it's, if you don't listen to that, then, then you're dead. You, you're, you're doing a TV pilot. Yeah, the, eventually the movie tells you what it wants to be. And, and you know, I, I love that you say that because I know there are some filmmakers that, that plan and plan uh, every shot. It, it, it's almost as though they're make, they've made their movie before they even start filming. And but the, yeah. the making of a movie, it's it's like a it's like a living thing, and I think exactly. I think an audience can feel that when they see the movie. Something like Apocalypse yeah. Now, you can feel yeah. the the, yeah. the behind the scenes. You can feel the making of that movie and the struggle. You can feel that within the movie. It's reflected in that. It makes it so much more powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. And uh, <clears throat> you know, it's uh, I think it's the same. Uh, you know, when you you look at the Godfather, who is absolutely stunning. It's just like the Godfather Part Two. Uh, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm positive that it was not written the way we see it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was not. There is no way it was. And uh, it, it, it's just as if they were, you know, the comparison between the Godfather, uh, you know, Robert De Niro, young Godfather, and Al Pacino being the Godfather. The way they compare the two story, it's a uh, it's fantastic writing. But I I know that there is a cinematographer behind it, and I know there is a director watching the dailies and watching what the movie was saying to them. I'm 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 sure it was. There is yeah. no other way you can cheat it this way. I, I, yeah. yeah. I don't think so. I mean, uh, it's um, uh, it's because it was so bold. Yeah, the first Godfather was so bold. You know, the, the layers, the different layers of light. You know, Gordon Willis was is a genius. It's really a, a true genius. You know, I think there was a, you know, a couple of geniuses, you know, just like Greg Toland, um, uh, Gordon Willis, Harry Savidas was a genius. For me. He, he was the, the, the best cinematographer. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, it's unfortunate he died, but uh, he was absolutely brilliant and. Uh, and there is some Italian, you know, French or Russian cinematographer who are, who are stunning too. But um, you, you have to be bold just to do what uh, 
what what God and Willis did on the Godfather, mm-hmm. and, and and understand the story the way it did. You know, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable. I wish I yeah. could. Yeah, it really, it's, um, it's just uh, stunning. I I agree with you. You know, my last question for you, and, and you, you've you've mentioned a, a couple of films and photographers already, but it, if you're if you're teaching a class on cinematography, um, mm-hmm. what what are the movies or the particular scenes you show your students to teach various lessons on the art form? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, there's many things I think. Uh, I think I would I would show. Um, I would definitely show something of uh, the scene I mentioned from Citizen Kane because I think it's uh, it's it's pure storytelling. Uh, I would show there is um, there is a couple of scenes in The Godfather Part Two uh, which are absolutely incredible in terms of uh, the layer. I mean the way the light is 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 and, and the light is done. But not technically, because it, the technical thing is boring. But uh, the way the shots are blocked, you know, so you have different layers, you have different action happening in the foreground, the background, and uh, it's lit a certain way. I, I, I don't know if you remember, but the first time um, uh, Al Pacino met with, uh, oh, what's the name of the guy? Johnny Holler, who worked for Hyman Roth, in, in the Godfather yes. Part Two, and he come and he bring an orange, and <clears throat> so it's kind of the foreground is kind of dark. I almost see it, and then there is uh, uh, you can see in the foreground it's lit because it's a uh, it's a Lake Tahoe in Nevada, and there is a party there. So you see the background being lit, and there's there is something in between which is half lit. I, I don't remember exactly, but it's just like you said, God, you know, it's it's stunning, and. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is, uh, or I would show Clute, uh, you know, the Alan J. Pakula movie that Gordon Willis did as well. Clute is, yeah. is fantastic. Um, I would show Manhattan, obviously, the Woody Allen, because it's uh, another Gordon Willis, but it's stunning. I would show uh, Finding Forrester, that uh, a Gazanson movie that uh, Harris T. has shot. Elephant, that he shot as well, which is the opposite. You know, it's uh, such a radical light. The yard that the Harry Savides shot. Mm. Um, I would obviously uh, show the um, La Notte, uh, the Antonioni movie, because uh, Gianni Di Venonzo did uh, uh, you know, an abstract work. It's just like pure painting, abstract painting with light, and it's uh, it's stunning. Uh, some Ber- some Bergman movie because it's an exist is. Is another legend, and um, the yeah, some, seal, something right? like the Seventh Seal. Yeah, that's essential. Yeah, yeah. 